you interpret 17 OHP level? And this causes a lot of confusion. There are three common units which we follow. One is nanogram per ml, nanogram per dl, and nanomole per liter. What is the relationship, Manoj? Sir, one nanogram per ml is equal to 100 nanogram per dl, hmm. and one nanogram per ml is equal to 0.3 nanomole per liter. Okay, so that is how you will be able to convert it. So this is something you need to understand. So commonly what I'm talking about is nanogram per DL. That is the unit I'm talking about. So if the level is less than 300 or 3 nanogram per ml, in India, most will say either nanogram per ml or nanogram per DL. So less than 300, don't think of CAH, is unlikely. Above 3500, about 35, it is most likely going to be there. And now remember, the more severe the defect, higher the 17 OHP. There is a clear cut linear, in fact, log linear relationship between enzyme activity and 17 OHP level. So if you're saying there is too much of salt wasting and your 17 OHP is in between, it is not going to be 21. Think of other variants, POR, think of 11 hydroxyl, think of 3 beta HST. More than 35, I am pretty happy in that regards. If it is between 300 to 1200, 300 to 12, think of variants as a possibility. And then think of 11, 3 beta, and all those things become likely. If it is between 12 to 35, 1200 to 35, then you should do an ACTL stimulation test to identify. And this I'm talking predominantly in the early age group. I'm talking more in terms of neonatal age group. I'm not talking about PCOS because there you're talking more of non-classical form. This is more likely to a classical form what I am looking at. So more than 3500 baseline or 35 nanogram per ml baseline is pretty much suggestive of a classical form of CAH. And if this becomes above 1000 or it goes above 10,000, definitely you're looking of classical form. If it goes above 1000, it is more likely to be a non-classical form. In a classical, it will go above 10,000 definitely after ACTH. So as discussed, classical levels will be hugely high, particularly salt wasting form. It may be hundreds. You will get level above 100 also. Non-classical, the levels will not be too high in that perspective. And if the basal is less than 2 and stimulated is less than 20, it is most likely to be normal in that regards. So how do you do the test? It's typical the same ACT stimulation test. You give cyanactin 250 micrograms and then you measure 17 OHP after one hour. Now, this is what we've discussed already. One nanogram per ml is 100 and 0.3 for nanogram per DL and nanomole per liter. This is how you convert that. Now, once you have done 17 OHP, do we routinely need to do a lot of other tests? So I would say tests like cortisol is not going to make much difference. ACTH is not going to make much difference. So don't do it routinely. If you're thinking of a deficiency or a CH, do these 17 OHP will be better. But look at electrolytes. You should measure electrolyte for 72 hours. And even if they are normal, measure every two days. Till 14 days, the crisis may happen. But if your 17 OHP is high, don't wait. Don't wait for electrolytes to become abnormal. Start on hydrocord and fructocord. Renin activity may help you. How does renin activity help you? So if renin is renin, um, renin activity is low. If renin activity is high, then you are deficient. And then even if it is a simple virilizing form, you have to give milnocorticoid. So that is important to get a renin activity. But don't do it in everybody. It is not going to help immediately. If you have a hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, getting a renin activity is not going to help you at the baseline. It may help you in follow-up. If you don't have salt wasting, then maybe you can think whether we, there is a covert deficiency or not. I do a renin activity. Cortisol is confirmatory, but I would not do it because we have seen so many cases in which cortisol becomes defective and often the interpretation is difficult. So don't go for cortisol in that scenario. What about prenatal diagnosis? Because often parents will come to you with genetic confirmation that we had other child. How do you assess for the next cell is affected or not? We can do uh, prenatal uh, testing like amniocentesis or... Uh... So on amniocentesis, what will you look at? And what time of the gestation is amniocentesis done? It, it should be done at this stage. What do you mean by early? How many weeks? Uh, four to eight weeks. <clears throat> amniocentesis? Should twelve weeks. 
So MNO synthesis is basically done around 12 to 16 weeks later, and you look at 17 OHP level. But if you do a chorionic villus sampling, in which you can actually get the genetic material out, this is more like doing a 17 OHP. Then you look at CVS and, and all those things. It can be done a bit early. So CVS can be done a bit early, but not amniocentesis. And <clears throat> you look for the hotspots. When you say hotspot, it means that these are the common sites of mutation which are there. And you look for 21A2 mutation. Now, why, why when you say uh, 21 hydroxylase is 90, 95% of all CAH, why, what are the cause? Why are the other defects less common than 21? Well, the pseudogene has a certain defect, so uh, means they are they present by uh, very nearby, so the mutation can occur very commonly. Okay, what is the pseudogene? It is a similar gene, but some uh, uh, it is a similar kind of gene, but uh, manifest manifestation will be same. But so basically, you are right that during evolution, the same gene was there. A copy of that gene was made with one or two variations. So this gene is sleeping. It's not going to work. But because it is close by, you can have a lot of exchanges which may happen during the process of crossover. So that is why because 21 hydroxylase has a pseudo gene, it causes much more chances of mutation. That is why it is more common. And that is why it is going to be very, very difficult to identify it when you look into in perspective of a NGS based. So if you do a NGS, you are looking at basically whether this code is there or not. You will pick up the pseudogene. You don't know whether it is actually the defective gene. So that's why 21 hydroxyl deficiency is not amenable to a NGS-based diagnosis. You need to go for Sanger sequencing or you go for hotspot. Now, what does hotspot mean? I am just looking at this particular position in this gene. If it's defective, if it's it will pick up. If it's not, it doesn't exclude. Then you go for the whole gene sequencing. This is an important message in that perspective. Now, non-invasive testing is NIPT. What is NIPT? No, no, what is? So what do you do in that? You did. Basically, in testing, basically, mother had both cell, mother cell and the fetal DNA, which is cell free. And we are, by taking mother mother cell, we are detecting the abnormal in the fetus. So, you look for the cell free DNA. So, you differentiate that this is first of all with this mother's or a child's, and then you assess from that. So, it is emerging as the most expanding technique, laboratory technique, as I discussed last time when I talked about genetics. So NIPT is something which is becoming very good because it is picking up, it's non-invasive. When you do a chorionic villus sampling, the child may actually have a, a miscarriage also which may happen because it's an invasive procedure. So that is why NIPT is non-invasive prenatal testing, basically looking at cell-free DNA. And you can identify without doing any invasive procedure whether the baby is affected or not. So that is an important progress in that regard. But it is still to be do, done in a better fashion for these conditions. It's often being used for many other conditions, but it is downs and all it has been most commonly used. Okay. So now neonatal screening. 